Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Health virtual open house for the master's program in humanitarian health. Um, my name is Megan Mingi. I'm one of our admissions officers, and I also have Paul Siegel, who's our program director. Hi, hi everyone. It's Paul Spiegel. Pleasure to be here. Um, and again, my name is Megan. I work with our admissions team to help potential applicants like yourself through the admissions process. Um, so just to run through our agenda for this evening, Paul will start us off in just a moment with an overview of um, the humanitarian health industry, um, as well as the program details for our specific master's program. Um, he'll talk through some career options and then dive into the curriculum as well as the online learning environment here at Johns Hopkins. Um, he'll also introduce some of the faculty members and then I'll share a little bit about the admission requirement as well as um, finances, scholarship info, all of that. And then at the end we have time for a question and answer session. So um, you'll see a little questions box that's available in GoToWebinar for you. Um, throughout the presentation, if you have questions, feel free to write them in there and we'll begin fielding those questions. Um, if there's something that uh, would be beneficial for our group to hear, then we'll present that to Paul and he'll be able to provide you answers. Um, if you have specific questions and it seems like it might be better to follow up with you individually, we're definitely happy to do that as well. So please do submit your questions throughout the evening. All right, and with that, Paul, I will kick it over to you if you wouldn't mind just um, introducing yourself and your background a little bit and then diving into the program details. Certainly. Um, good evening or morning to everyone, wherever you may be. Uh, my name is Paul Spiegel. I'm a Canadian um, physician and an epidemiologist, and I um, am a professor at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and I direct the Hopkins Center for Humanitarian Health. And that's, the center is a, um, it's actually combining the three schools of the School of Public Health, the School of Medicine, and the School of Nursing. Uh, and so we have approximately 35 faculty uh, on the center from these three schools. And we do a mixture of, um, of teaching and training, of research, and also what we call empowerment, which is a mixture of um, trying to ensuring that we power, empower students and governments and NGOs with, with whom we work, but also trying to use evidence-based uh, argumentation data to um, advocate for refugees, for internally displaced persons, and for those affected by conflict. Uh, before joining Hopkins about two years ago, I was um, with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Um, for many years, the, the Chief of Public Health uh, at, at UNHCR, and then the last few years before I joined Hopkins, I was um, Deputy Director of a program, uh, called what's called the Program and Support and Management, and I was in charge of the, the technical sectors for the organization. So it's a it's a pleasure to be here, and um, maybe I'll start. Um, Megan, should I start just going into some of the slides? Sure, that would be great. Okay. So, we're th this program in humanitarian health, which what we call humanitarian health, really does try to um, address all of the broad uh, aspects of humanitarian emergencies. That would be natural disasters conflicts, um, epidemics, or, and then technological disasters. Um, we do emphasize primarily uh, conflicts and natural disasters. And as, as we know right now, there, it doesn't say on the slide, but there are, are over 66 million people that are currently forcibly displaced uh, from their homes. This is uh, a mixture primarily of conflict-related um, response and we have internally displaced persons uh, that are nearly 40 million and about 26 million refugees. And as you likely know, the difference is internally displaced persons are those that have not crossed a recognized border that are had, have had to move from their homes but are still in their country of origin and refugees have crossed a border. 
Um, and what we're trying to do in the whole idea of humanitarian health is to work with students with and students of varying backgrounds um, and try to give them the knowledge as well as the as well as the 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 book knowledge but also the practical knowledge and this is a, a masters of applied science so we'll be looking at various case studies to allow them to allow students across the board to look at policy issues at strategy current ways of assessment, um, current ways to look at humanitarian response plans and then write, uh, write budgets to be able to try to advocate for your organizations. Um, but ultimately, what we want to do is try to improve the health of um, those affected by um, natural disasters and, and conflicts. Um, Clearly, there's been an increase, uh, both in terms of the numbers of conflicts, but also conflicts and natural disasters in the last while. But also, the bi another big issue is that they're prolonged or protracted. Um, they're lasting longer. The average time that a refugee is a refugee now varies between 10 to 17 years. Um, and so the way we are responding now is changing, and we will we'll be discussing a lot of these issues. You know, a lot of the way we started off with was started off the, in humanitarian health was in low-income countries in camps. And now more refugees are outside of camps. And besides low-income countries, we have massive uh, conflicts in Syria and in um, uh, Iraq, where um, these are middle-income countries and they require a different response. So the idea of humanitarian health, I'm at the, the, last, uh, the last bullet point, is really to focus on the health of, of populations. Um, and we're going to be looking at various tools. And as we mentioned, both into that the management, the policy, as well as the delivery. So what will, you know, I could go on for a while, but that would be the first lecture of the series. But, um, you know, what, we, what do we hope that you will gain from the Masters of Applied Science in Humanitarian Health? Certainly, uh, the tools to be able to adopt and adapt. I mean, as we re this field is really, really changing. Um, just as some some quick examples is um, there's a big push to move from in kind aid, which means delivering aid, to actually sorry delivering food, blankets, jerry cans, to cash based interventions, and this is uh, really um, really become more in depth and sophisticated in countries like Jordan and Lebanon and Turkey, where many of the refugees are getting ATM cards and they're actually deciding what they wish to buy as opposed to us being realistic and deciding what they need to buy, innate what they need to have. We're, we want to really look at existing organizations from NGOs to the United Nations to government, um, but also start looking at the private sector and looking at the roles of the military. We want to try to, whenever we can, use evidence, um, existing evidence, and in, um, into applied research, as well as use this evidence to advocate openly. I mean, there's no question right now we're in a world where populism is increasing and there's a, a strong discrimination against refugees, economic migrants, internally displaced persons. And we really want to share the facts um, Many of which are many of which are um, not well known in the public. To be able to advocate to governments, to policy decision makers, to be able to make at least be aware of the facts, uh, and hopefully that can um, that can influence them. So this will be an interdisciplinary program. We'll be looking at we'll, we'll be looking at global issues regional issues. I mean, it's how the humanitarian response in the regions in, in Middle East and North Africa and the politics involved, the ethnic and religious issues are quite different than other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa to uh, issues in, in uh, Myanmar and Bangladesh with the Rohingya. So we'll be looking at a global level and some of the big issues, the regional issues, as well as some of the local issues. Um, we're going to be looking, you know, humanitarian health, one cannot, one has to look health in the broad sense. So we'll be looking at water sanitation and nutrition, protection, and 
politics is part of this. The, the humanitarian response and politics are inextricably linked. And so when you look at the when you look at the Syria crisis right now, uh, and you look at the Security Council, clearly politics, both at the global and regional level, are part of this. So we'll also be discussing that. Um, and as I said, trying to use the latest scientific knowledge. Um, we will we will be looking at all of the latest studies um, that are and more and more coming out, and see how that will affect um, the way we respond, both strategically and then interventions. So we'll be looking at the, ter the determinants of health, and I guess I've spoken about some of these, but it's going to be uh, preventive medicine, interventions, medical care, um, mental health is a, is a huge issue, as well as sexual and gender-based violence, uh, behaviors and lifestyle of populations. Um, and this is, you know, humanitarian health, uh, conflict, natural disasters, is so broad that we need to look at the uh, issues related to social, environmental, and economic factors. And just as some examples, we'll be looking at shelter, we'll be looking at um, uh, fuel and how this can affect populations' health, and certainly economics, the, the big issues in terms of poverty, in um, terms of livelihoods, and what can and cannot happen in terms of what governments will allow refugees and IDPs will they allow to will they be allowed to work um, if they can work and we look into different uh, different ways can we look into health insurance there you know there are over 10 countries now where refugees actually are able to uh, apply for health insurance but if they can't work and can't pay for some of their um, premiums then it makes it a bit more complex in terms of sustainability So in terms of careers in humanitarian health, um, we're looking for, I think a lot of the people that we're looking for are people that have interest in health and broad public health, people who are practitioners either in the field, but also people that have an interest in this that may not necessarily have had as much international experience as they would like, that have worked maybe with the Red Cross or Red Crest in their home countries that have looked from a different area, different uh, disaster preparedness and response, um, working with refugees resettled in their own countries, but want to really understand what's happening in the countries from where these refugees are coming from. Um, there is a, sadly in a way, but there's a very high demand for um, practitioners and leaders in this field across the board from administration, to policy, to management, to uh, response. Um, we also hope that we will be getting a nice mixture of uh, people from the United States, people from Europe, and people from all over the world, and so students from all over the world, because part of um, what we really want to do here is make sure that we're learning from each other and also really trying to understand the different contexts where these are occurring. And so um, we'll talk about the administration and how this will work. And then in terms of possible jobs, um, there are a lot. I mean, all you need to do is go to Relief Web, um, which is a, a website that actually has hundreds of jobs that are available across the world in, in humanitarian health. And these can vary from being non-governmental organizations, governments themselves, the International Red Cross, Red Crescent, there are a lot of humanitarian emergency and disaster response agencies in many, many countries, think tanks uh, and organizations that are dealing more on the policy level. So we think across the board um, there with a, a degree like this that we're hopeful that um, this will increase opportunities for those that are already in the field or, or, and or hopefully open up opportunities for those that have had some experience abroad, but have not necessarily worked specifically in humanitarian health. So in terms of the, the program details, this will be a, a Master's of Applied Science in Humanitarian Health, a 49 term credit, 49 credits. Um, and we'll look at this, there are four terms in each of the academic years. Um, I'll let my colleagues from discuss a little bit more in terms of will this be a two-year, three-year, or a program. I think some of it just depends on because this is meant for 
professionals that are already working uh, for the most part. Some of you may be able to do more than others depending on the demands of your jobs. Um, we really want to make this uh, a mixture of not just lectures, almost like what I'm doing now with slides, but we're hoping to have a very wide variety of courses, of live talks, looking through YouTube videos to um, looking at case studies to make it as interesting and practical as possible. Um, as I mentioned, it's it's part it's it's a part time, um, but in a hundred percent online. It doesn't require you to actually come to Baltimore at Hopkins um, to in person. And then we're going to be using um, we have a whole team of people um, who help us pedagogically to make sure that we are um, making this as interesting as and as interactive as as possible. And then we're going to be focusing on understanding and leading humanitarian health programs. Um, another big area that I think has been neglected, certainly when I was at UNHCR, we saw this, is that people would come out from these programs, but many of them would be technically strong, but didn't really understand how coordination, how management and leadership works. Um, and so we really want to be able to focus on that as well. And that's why we've put together what we hope is a, is a broad um, a broad curriculum, but making sure as well that you get everyone who gets a master's from Johns Hopkins will have the basics of epidemiology, biostatistics, a lot of the really important areas that make Hopkins uh, who we are and that will give you the skills to be able to deal both uh, quantitatively and qualitatively. So this is looking at the uh, at the curriculum here, um, and you can see these are uh, so we have year one 24 credits and year two 25 credits, and then the one two three four are when these courses are offered. And um, as we said, some people will do it in two years, some people may do it longer, depending on how how. And so um, these will be offered con consecutively. So. Um, in term two after year one for the second cohort would be this would eventually be available for to be taken um, at either time you know in the second term of your year one or your year two once the program gets started. Um, I think what I, I hopefully you can read this and then we will actually have some discussions I hope directly from you either you know questions um, but going in yeah so I think it'll be it would take probably too long to go over the details of each of these courses, but you'll see there's a mixture of um, very specific courses that are um, humanitarian health related. There are some such as um, number two, for example, design and planning of primary health care projects. This is we will have in, in most of these courses, such as this one, we will have a humanitarian health component, there'll be a case study. So um, others may be taking this course and they're looking more broadly in global health, but we'll be looking very specifically for humanitarian um, case studies here. In term, year one, term four, we'll have the statistical concepts in public health. So this is going to be more of, um, of uh, biostats. And when we work through, we will, for instance, in term one, in term one year two, we have specific approaches, assessment approaches in humanitarian settings. This is a very, this is course deals directly with surveillance methods, um, surveys in humanitarian settings, because the whole issue of data, of assessments and monitoring evaluation is hugely important and often not done very well. Um, We'll have very specific courses on nutrition and food security, on water and sanitation, on leadership and management. Um, so these will all be humanitarian health courses. Some of these will be new. We're developing it specifically for OPAL. The whole issue in terms of human rights and humanitarian emergencies, for example, it's always been a massive issue. But at this point, when we look at all the attacks on healthcare workers and hospitals, um, the human rights component is becoming more and more essential. Um, we'll have mental health in, emer in humanitarian emergencies, an area that in the past was not sufficiently uh, dealt with. And 
mental health together with uh, non-communicable diseases, not just commun not just the classic communicable diseases, are areas that are becoming more and more important, particularly as we um, as we look at uh, middle income countries, but even in the even in the low income countries, it's it's been important but hasn't had sufficient emphasis. Um, and then there's a, and I haven't gone through all of them, but there's an integrative program, an integrative activity, which is four credits. And that's going to be what some of you may know as capstones or other areas, but it's basically, it's going to be a project that you will be working on and you'll be mentored with um, one of our faculty to be able to try to, the whole idea is to try to be able to look at what everything that you've learned thus far in the program, um, perhaps look at a program or wherever you're working now and try to use the concepts and the skills from the last uh, all the other courses to apply these skills to a specific area and we can discuss more about that as well if you're interested i think that's it on this slide um so yes there will be a lot of we we've been doing online learning hopkins has been leading in this field for for many years we have online uh, some online master's programs um, we don't have this will be our first online humanitarian health program which is why we're quite excited and we're also hoping to reach people um, as we said sort of mid-career professionals that are going to be continuing working while taking uh, this course so this has been an opportunity that hasn't been available in the past um, we are working with uh, with a group that at, the, at Hopkins that deals with online programs so that everything will be of, of we've already seen this, a very high produ uh, production value. Um, and we will do our best to keep the students in, engaged. And certainly one of the ways by doing that, doing this, is by doing live talks. <clears throat> so just before this, I was at the school doing a live talk for students studying broad global global health, um, speaking specifically on communicable diseases and humanitarian emergencies. And this was not a lecture format, but rather a discussion format. We had both uh, faculty there as well as the students uh, chiming in. The faculty recorded courses will be, um, the other things, yes, everything will be recorded so that you can look at and address this on your own time, um, but they will have to be done, the lectures and the exams will have to be done during the uh, period of the semesters. Um, and we could talk a little bit about that. And there will be 24 seven help desk as well as um, every course besides the faculty will have a teaching assistant who will be able to help you in terms of their either questions technically as well as issues in terms of examinations. Next slide. So looking at the faculty, this is just a, a list. I'm, I'm the, um, I will be the program director. Um, we'll have two deputy program directors, Cortland Robinson, who also runs the PhD program in the Department of International Health and is core faculty at the center. Um, his specialty is a lot on, on trafficking and on hard to reach populations. He's a demographer. We have Shannon Ducey, um, who will be the other pro deputy program director. Her specialty is on health systems and she's really looking now and doing a lot of research in cash-based interventions. And she's done a lot on nutrition in the past and, and broad, um, broad surveys. And then um, across the board, we have Daniel Barnett, who is an expert more in disaster preparedness and natural disasters. Judy Bass is a professor and she is, her expertise is in mental health. Uh, Bill Brieger will be speaking and he's, his is in broad global health. Gilbert Burnham is a professor and he previously um, directed uh, another version of this center um, years back. And he's an expert in health systems and does a tremendous amount of work in the Middle East and Afghanistan. Um, jumping around, let's just see, I mean, we won't go through everyone here. Leonard Rubinstein, if you look there, he is a, uh, he was previously the director of, um, or the CEO for, it'll come to me, I'm having a blank, Physicians for Human Rights. And he's a lawyer by trade and he's, um, 
part of our center. He's also part of the Center for Health and Human Rights, and he's leading globally, leading the um, um, a group, a consortium who are um, trying to better measure and trying to advocate against attacks on healthcare workers and um, health facilities. And we have Lauren Sauer, who is both at our center as well as the School of Medicine, and she has an expertise in global health security. Well, thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so um, you've heard lots of great information about the program. Uh, we hope that your interest is peaked and you are ready to apply. So I wanted to talk through um, how to go about that application process. We use an application portal called SOFIS. Um, so you can go to our website and find a link to that portal pretty easily. Um, your application and documents will be submitted through that portal, so it's a largely electronic process. Um, to apply, you do need a bachelor's degree from a regionally accredited college or university. Um, if you studied internationally, then you would have your degree evaluated to confirm uh, its equivalency. And we ask for a minimum of two years of public health work experience. So earlier in the presentation, Paul talked a little bit about um, the experience that we're looking for here. You may have international experience. Your experience may be more domestic. Um, if you've got questions about whether your prior work in the field would qualify you for this program, don't hesitate to reach out to us and we're happy to um, help you find the answer to that question. Um, you'll also supply a current resume or CV as well as three professional and or academic letters of recommendation. Um, and then one of the most important parts of your application process is your statement of purpose. So um, that document is your opportunity to tell our admissions review committee why you're pursuing a Johns Hopkins master's in humanitarian health. So um, what in your background drew you to the program, what you plan to do following completion of the degree. That's a really important piece and one um, that we definitely uh, review very closely as we want to make sure that, that this program is for our candidates. Um, if you're an international student, we do look for proficiency in English via test scores from either TOEFL or the IELTS test, um, as well as your credential evaluation by World Education Services. So you may already be familiar with that credential evaluating process. If you're not, our admissions advisors are, are happy to talk through that as well. Um, we are accepting applications now, and they're reviewed on a monthly basis. I definitely highly recommend starting the application process as soon as possible. Um, not only does it help you to garner an admissions decision more quickly, but it also helps in case, you know, one of your recommendations takes a little while to be submitted, things like that. So applying earlier gives you the peace of mind to be done with that process as quickly as possible. Um, and our deadline to submit your application is July 1st, 2018. Uh, we enroll students for each fall and our upcoming academic year begins on Tuesday, September 4th. So talking through the, the finances of the program, um, our tuition for the upcoming year is $1,128 per credit hour. For our OPAL students, so this is part of our OPAL program suite, we do have some scholarships available in the amount of $433 per credit. So that brings the price per credit to around $695. Um, to apply for that scholarship, you simply submit an app admissions application. So there's no separate form to apply for the scholarship. Um, you may also be able to consider additional options to fund your degree, such as financial aid. Uh, Johns Hopkins does, expect, does accept um, federal financial aid through federal and private loans. And you can see the contact information on the screen there if you have questions about financial aid eligibility. Um, you may also want to consider tuition reimbursement from your um, place of employment. And then, of course, many of our students pay out of pocket as well. So 
like Paul mentioned, um, the program can be completed in two years. You also have up to four years. So some of our students may um, take a little longer to complete the program so that they can you know, keep their budget in mind as they're paying for courses along the way. So with that, we've come to the end of um, the presentation component of our virtual open house, but I'm happy to say that we've received lots of great questions from our attendees. Uh, so Paul, we'll go ahead and, and send a few of these questions your way. Um, one of them that we received is regarding class dynamics. So what kind of class size can I expect? Um, is there a lot of person-to-person -person contact? What can I expect as far as interaction from the faculty? Yeah, um, let's see. I mean, this is the first time that we're, we're offering this, so it's hard to know how big the class will be, but, um, and I don't know, Megan, even if you're able to answer that from some of the previous uh, opals that we've, that you've had uh, done in the past. Um, so I think an average class size might be anywhere from um, 25 to 40, sometimes a little smaller, especially for some of those classes that are very specific to humanitarian health. Um, and then in terms of interaction, while you spoke to the, the components of the program, such as live talks, things like that, where you definitely want to make this an immersive experience for students. So I think that's a testament to um, the investment that the faculty make in this program as well. Yeah, and so we um, the the lectures will be recorded, but recorded, and then there'll be a mixture. As we said, we try to um, they'll be recorded with PowerPoints. But then, what we in order to mix it up, what we're doing, and we've not really done this. We've done some of this in the past, and some of this is new. So one of the things that we're doing is, or I'm planning to do at least in many of the courses that I'm teaching, will be doing interviews. Skype interviews with key people throughout the world um, who are experts in this field, and so we've started to do that already. And because of at least my past with the with the UN, and then with knowing various NGOs, we'll be asking them um, certain aspects, certainly in, in terms of leadership and management. But we'll be able to talk to them about responses to certain, whether it be Ebola or other areas, and then. Um, there will be, as I mentioned, for each course, there'll be a TA, and the TA will have be able to interact, uh, the teaching assistant, in terms of very specific questions um, that you may have in terms of any assignments or readings. And then I think probably the main interaction with the faculty will be these live talks. And as we said, the live talks, which are not meant to be lectures, they're really meant to be either discussion groups or normally what we would do is if either we as a faculty would be speaking and or we can bring in um, other people who have if we're talking about something quite specific and we want to talk about uh, either leadership or strategy or even budgetary issues we can bring in in program officers or um, leaders in the field and have them on live talk because some of us need to be in the studio, but the rest of us can be anywhere in the world with decent internet connection. Great, thank you. Um, along those lines, we've had, you, <clears throat> excuse me, we've had a few questions come in about um, kind of the interactions in the course among classmates. So is group work a part of the program? Um, as well as what kind of networking opportunities exist in the program? Um, yes, group work will definitely be part of the program, as well as um, making sure that you students in a in a constructive way will be able to review and and um, critique other students' work. And so we'll be, you know, there'll be different ways of doing this because it's it's online as opposed to in class. But we will be, for example, doing certain case studies and um, what I to do is to switch around what we're doing in in-person class where we'll get a group of students who will be responding to 
for example, I can give you something specific, a civilian trauma response in Iraq. And, and this was some, a report that we did recently and some really interesting conundrums have come up um, in terms of Geneva Conventions, in terms of, uh, in terms of the way organizations worked with the, the military. So we'll have case studies with certain questions and then we will expect in groups and we'll, there'll be small groups because if the group is too big, it gets too complicated when you're online. Um, so, so students would work on trying to answer these and then you would have other groups um, that would critique and then you would have either the faculty or the TA um, also pr providing their feedback. Uh, there was another part to the question of, of which I've forgotten. Um, what kind of networking opportunities are available? So I'm sure group work definitely provides that opportunity, but perhaps um, with via faculty or alumni networking, things like that as well. Yeah, um, I mean, part of what we do also, so certainly in the integrative activity and the fourth term, I think that's a time that there will be um, there will be time to network, but um, and time to be working with others. But because what we try to do also is link up people. So we do have a broad network and uh, both in terms of our faculty. So, you, so if you go onto our website, you'll see our faculty and our, our advisory committee. But we're also, I just have not um, had the time to finalize this. We're in the midst of having, uh, we'll probably have between 20 to 30 affiliates of the center. And these will be people that are not Hopkins people, so from NGOs, from uh, UN agencies that want to be affiliated with that. And part of the terms of reference is to allow them to, is to allow students to be able to contact them. Uh, you know, we'll have to be judicious in how we do this. So part of the, part of this will be certainly be, uh, we hope, um, enlarging the work. And I think many of the faculty have strong connections with the NGOs and the UN agencies, so we, we should be able to help with that. Great, thank you. Um, and one more quick question about the dynamics of the classes themselves. Um, about how many hours per week would you expect students to be participating in each class? I think a, a benchmark for our OPAL programs tends to be somewhere between 15 to 20 hours per week per course. Yeah, I mean, what I was, um, what I, what we try to say also is for every credit or for every, every class, let's say it's, 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 let's say uh, if a class is approximately an hour to an hour and a half, there's another at least one to two hours of reading and activities involved in terms of it, maybe it would be, and that includes either uh, papers or midterms and then reading all of the you know with every class it's not just of course listening to the lecture but there are readings that need to be done um, but I say what you know what you said Megan as well makes a lot of sense I think it just depends on how many um, credits uh, the students are taking per term because there is a, a bit of a choice of people either for work or for financial reasons want to uh, not do this in two years but let's say in three years Great, thank you. Um, we have a, a quick question that I can help with uh, related to whether a GRE score is required. I'm happy to say it is not. <laughs> so the, the testing requirements that we have would be that if you, um, if your native language is not English, then you would need to submit um, English proficiency scores. Um, and then, Paul, another question for you was related to um, how much of the focus of the program is related to practical application. So if someone's already in the field, um, what can they inspect in terms of theory versus practical um, course? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. And it's, it's always a fine balance. Um, there, there are. I think there will, we will, we will, we will also be able to to change the balance and have feedback. But the idea is, for those that are currently working in the field, often they're in a certain area, and 
what we want to do is to try to provide everyone with the breadth uh, of knowledge that is needed um, and also to provide the, the so that's one is is the breadth of knowledge so for example if they're concentrating in health and they're actually a clinical person in health the whole preventive component the whole issue of protection um, the whole issue of shelter and how that relates to health will, will be discussed. Um, secondly, though, within, within many of these situations, we want to be able to then make it practical by having case studies. And even if you're in the field, but have, working in the field, but are primarily work, have worked in one area or one country, the other important aspect is to try to give case studies in different parts of the world because um, they differ so greatly in, in context. Um, so I, I think also we will be able to have a better idea of how we tailor this when we know the background of, of the students. Um, but already, and, and the, the, the curriculum is, is um, developed in such a way that, that beyond the sort of the, the, the compulsory epi and biostats, we start off with a broad, broader introduction and we talk about the public health and humanitarian emergencies. And then we go on to specifics of the healthcare, of nutrition, um, and the in the broad areas there. So we'll do our best to find a good balance. Great, thank you. Um, and you mentioned Epi and Biostat, so I wanted to circle back on that. Um, are you looking for students to have a, a background in the kind of quantitative field before they come into your program? Um, if they don't have that background, how can they prepare for the, the quantitative coursework that they can expect? Yeah, good question. And and don't worry would be the answer is that we're this is not going to be we, we, we talked about it at one point and actually at one point we had different tracks and we decided against it. So the idea the, the people that are teaching epi and biostats we we understand that some people it comes naturally and some quantitative can be particularly can be a bit scary and so there are these are courses that are meant to be i don't want to use the word basic because they're they're, they're but they are meant to be able to provide everyone with the the uh sufficient in sufficient um understanding to look at surveillance to look at assessments to understand rates um, and the Epi and Biostats, they've been doing this for many years, and so they have a, a lot of TAs, and there's extra, there are ways to do extra, to get extra support um, if needed for the quantitative. Um, and this is, so this is not a, a new question or a concern, and we have not had issues in terms of students that are really concerned about the math, and um, we, have, we have sufficient means to be able to help you to get through this. Great, thank you. Um, we're getting toward the end of our list of questions. I do want to mention we have received some fairly specific questions. So um, you've got our contact information on the screen. If we did not answer your question, it's probably because we want to, you know, talk with you about it personally and make sure that we kind of tailor our response to your question. So don't hesitate to reach out to us either by phone or email. Um, but Paul, just one more for you. Um, you know, you mentioned that we're expecting an international audience. Um, if we have either people living abroad or disaster responders, um, is there flexibility if, say, someone is in an area where there is an internet available? Um, what kind of resources might be available there? Um, yes, I mean, you know, to be able to do this, you're going to need the internet. But if people are are far away and and they're, for example, if they're working in wherever Chad or Sudan or wherever they're working, and they need to be able, they have to be able to travel into the field into the more remote areas where there's not internet. It would be difficult if they had to do that for eight weeks because we, that's that's traditionally the the time of the semesters, but. This will allow you to go away for a couple of weeks where you have limited internet, and then you will have to, when you come back, you're going to have to um, obviously, uh, what would be the word, do a little bit more intense work in terms of the internet. What 
I don't know, and maybe Megan, you can answer is, are they able to download the ahead of time so that the, the courses, so they actually don't need the internet to listen to the courses? It's, it's something I actually hadn't thought of. Um, I don't know that answer, but we can figure it out. We can actually find out if you don't know. That's a good question. Um, I think it would depend on what the professor would offer within the course. So, um, you know, I do imagine if if that's a concern. Generally, what we suggest is that a student reach out to a professor as soon as they know that this kind of issue might arise, and then the professor will work with them to find out which types of assignments could be provided ahead of time, which would need to be followed up on later in the in the term. Mm -hmm. Um, one other thing I want to mention is that we do have a student services coordinator who works with our students throughout um, their program. And so that coordinator helps with things like, um, oh, I'm not sure I'll be able to take a class this term. How do I add or drop that class? When's my deadline to drop the class? Things like that. So we do have a resource who's specifically dedicated to kind of the administrative side of things. That way, if a student were to find that they are going to be gone for a full eight weeks, um, we could guide them toward, you know, rearranging their class schedule accordingly. And I, I would just add that we, I mean, we want that the student who is working in the field and has to go to areas where there isn't um, internet for a period of time. So we would do, that's the sort of student we would love to be able to work with. So we would would make sure that we would figure out a way um, to make it easy to make it easier for the student to make to, to deal with this and if, if it requires when you do have internet to be able to download certain lectures um, we'll make it happen because um, um, that's the sort of student that we'd love to work with who I hopefully will benefit uh, from what we, we have to offer wonderful well um, Paul I really appreciate your um, having you join us this evening and just getting to hear from you about the, the program and the opportunities there. Um, to our attendees, I also wanted to say thank you for joining us. And um, if you missed a component of, of this session or would like to kind of re-listen, we'll also be providing this to you. Um, so we hope to hear from you in the coming days and to help you move forward through that application process. Paul, do you have any final words for our attendees tonight? Um, just that uh, I hope this was uh, helpful to you. And um, feel free to, to reach out uh, via Megan. And if there are questions, we would, further questions that we haven't been able to answer, we will, um, or that you haven't, you haven't asked uh, at this point, we will certainly uh, answer them when they come to us. And, um, I hope that at least, if not all of you, many of you will um, will take this course and we would look forward to working with you. Great. Thank you. All right. We hope you have a great night, everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Good night. Good morning, wherever you may be.